Uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm Harold Coe. It's my great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, our second keynote speaker, His Excellency K. Rala Shanana Guzmao. Um, it is not often that you get a chance to introduce someone by saying simply, he is the father of his country. Uh, but that is an accurate description. Uh, he was born on the small island of East Timor. In 1981, he was elected to be the leader of the resistance and commander in chief of the armed forces. He was imprisoned by the Indonesians in 1992, but continued to lead the resistance from captivity and was released after uh, an overwhelming independence vote in a UN-sponsored referendum by the Timorese people in 1999. <clears throat> he then became the first elected president of Timor-Leste since the restoration of independence and brought Timor-Leste into uh, the, uh, the first sovereign state uh, created in the 21st century. Since then, he was again elected prime minister of 2000, uh, in 2007 and has devoted himself in following his leadership for political independence with a drive to achieve the economic independence of his country. In that capacity, he served as minister for planning and strategic investment, uh, an eminent person of the G7 Advisory Council, and leading the development of Timor-Leste's uh, South Coast Development Project. He continues to serve as president of the CNRT, the leader of the current government coalition, which was elected in 2018. He is the author of many books, including his autobiography, To Resist is to Win. He is a recipient of the Grand Cross of the Order of Liberty, an honorary KCMG from the United Kingdom, the Grand Collar of the Order of Prince Henry from Portugal. He's been awarded the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought, the Sydney Peace Prize, the Kwangju Prize for Human Rights, and the North-South Prize <coughs> by the Council of Europe. And this is all a man who likes to say, uh, I wish I was just back being a pumpkin farmer in my own hometown. I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, President Guzmao 20 years ago in uh, Indonesia, in Jakarta. Uh, I had been uh, asked to be the Assistant Secretary of State for the United States for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor under uh, then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, my friend Lee Feinstein, uh, who is uh, the Dean of the Indiana Hamilton Luger School was also working with us at the same time. And we made a trip to Indonesia where uh, Secretary Albright decided that her first priority was to see uh, <coughs> Shana Naguzmao, who at the time was being held prisoner uh, outside of Jakarta. And she simply refused to leave unless they either brought her to uh, Minister Guzmao, or brought him to her. And there was kind of a standoff. We were in the lobby of a hotel, and then suddenly the Indonesians gave in, and they brought uh, Minister Guzmao on the back of a motorcycle. And so we saw a huge traffic jam, one motorcycle sort of snaking along behind a driver and sitting behind him, someone wearing a black helmet and a football jersey, which I think said Vodafone. <laughs> and uh, he got off the motorcycle with his motorcycle helmet, came over, pulled his helmet off, and his hair was glistening with sweat. Um, and he looked like what an American beer commercial calls the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> Now, it was interesting because at the time, he did not speak English. But um, everyone who saw him realized that we had seen someone very special. <clears throat> As he was leaving, Secretary Albright turned to all of us and said, you have just met the Nelson Mandela of Timor-Leste. And so it's a very great pleasure that uh, we have the opportunity to hear from him today, a pumpkin farmer, resistance leader, 
statesman, and his most important recent role as chief negotiator and for maritime boundaries, a role he's held now for three years. He led the negotiation under the unclosed compulsory conciliation process that culminated in the signing in 2018 of the historic Maritime Boundary Treaty with uh, Australia. You heard that described this morning by Gar Schofield, but uh, we will hear a keynote address now from Minister Guzman, which I'm sure will describe that experience from his perspective. Minister? The problem is that uh, if you don't say in two minutes, he talked for seven minutes. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, good afternoon and thank you to my friend uh, Harold for talking too much. <laughs> for your so generous introduction. Before I begin, I also want to thank Dean Feinstein. Oh yes, up there. And recognize that without the work of Indian University, Hamburg University, and the support of uh, ITLAS, will not be here today. It is a pleasure to be in Hamburg with you at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the home of Anglers. I want to acknowledge the esteemed attendees, including Jean Hume Peck, Jacques Egel, of course, Harold Gold, Rina Lee, among others, who give this conference its real importance, as we started to understand from this morning. I know that people have traveled so far, including us, to be here, and you should be proud of your commitment to strengthening anchors. I also want to extend that, that acknowledgement to those others who could not be here, including the delegation from Vanuatu, who have sent their ambassador to represent them here. Vanuatu faces the same problem as we faced with Australia. So far today, we have already heard from some of the leading experts in the law of the sea about Anglos and dispute resolution. And we will hear from many more before the end of the conference. When the law of the sea convention was signed in 1982, the world could not have known just how important it would be in governing the international maritime order and how effectively it would help in conflict management. Now, 25 years since it came into effect, it is right for us to reflect, as we are doing since this morning, on the success of Anglos. Few would have imagined then that the Timorese guerrilla and freedom fighter of that era would stand before a gathering like this one to celebrate Timor-Leste as a triumph of the international system. There is no longer an occupation, no longer a war, but a proud democracy marching forward into the future. 
When we restored our independence, it was a magnificent day, a triumph of the international system, a moment of vindication for many who invested hope in the rules-based system of the international law. I particularly remember the words of Kofi Annan, independence will not mean the end of the world's commitment to Timor-Leste. I'm here not just to tell the story of a young country, young democracy, moving from fragility to resilience, a country that believes in the rule of law and the promise of the rules-based architecture. But I'm here to say, we are not alone in the world. <clears throat> our success may inspire, but our challenges and our opportunities are what so many countries face. And at a time when the international system is being tested in fundamental ways. So let me share with you the good news and, sorry to say, the bad ones. The good news is that Timor Leste's story is one of hope. In the previous sessions, this word came, hope. After the resistance, <clears throat> we restored independence as an independent nation, but we weren't truly free because we did not have permanent maritime boundaries with either of uh, our neighbors, Australia and Indonesia. We could not claim our seas and those resources which, under international law, belong to us we could not secure our own future. As you know, this has recently changed, and that change shows what is possible through the international architecture. After years of trying and failing, and trying and failing again, just to even start a serious dialogue on maritime boundaries with Australia. In 2016, we turned to compulsory conci conciliation. Garrett explained it this morning very well. In fact, I would like to point out we are so fortunate to have Where are you? Oh, Judge Coroma. <laughs> yeah, there. He will talk in the next session. One of our esteemed commissioners here with us at this conference to provide, maybe, his great insight into Anglos and our compulsory conciliation process, as Garrett did already this morning. <clears throat> the compulsory conciliation was the last resort we had, designed for countries like ours where a neighbor refuses to negotiate bilaterally, but has also withdrawn from the binding dispute resolution mechanism under Anglos. And we know there are cases like this still. The compulsory conciliation process had never been used before and came, into, and came with no guarantee of success. But the international system had delivered for us once before, and we were determined to try again by trusting in the power of the justice. 
After 18 months, we managed to reach agreement with Australia, and in March of 2018, we signed a treaty at the headquarters of the United Nations, witnessed by Secretary General Antonio Guterres. <clears throat> After a hard-fought struggle, a struggle of undeniable political and economic significance for our country, we delimited our maritime boundary with Australia. With the signing of the Maritime Boundary Treaty, the rights and the responsibilities of Timor-Leste and Australia concerning the resources and activities within our respective sovereign territories were finally clarified. For Timor-Leste, establishing jurisdiction over our maritime territory was bound to our sovereignty and to our prospects for the future. Our long path to independence, which has required much courage and sacrifice from our people, could only be complete if we could exert our rights over that which belongs to us and set our own path towards development. It meant the difference over everything involving the blue economy. As um, I forgot your name, Gabriela. Um, yesterday, uh, this morning, already, already talked about this, the economy of the sea. Tourism is a good example. The warm waters of Timor-Leste house of Timor-Leste house coral reefs considered to be among the most well-preserved in the world. Here, I invite you all to go and to enjoy. And in two weeks, the whales coming from Australia that now are in New Zealand will come and uh, with dolphins, we salute you. Hello, <laughs> they will say. In fact, Conservation International recently stated the waters surrounding the island of Aturu, a small island in the north, have the greatest biodiversity concentration in the entire world. We are proud of this and we will establish a center there for marine, marine conservation or preservation, marine, how to say, marine life um, conservation. This morning also we heard many about this, but it is also fisheries maritime transportation, as well as a strategic development opportunities in energy and mineral resources. We are now on a path to move forward in these areas. That is the good news I bring you now. And that is the opportunity. But here is the bad news. And here lies the challenge for all of us, even for us, for us in terms that if I had already a lunch, I could not see people dying because of hunger. That is why we all must take this responsibility. Today, in a world full of conflict, this is the problem. This is the problem. In a world full of, the pro full of conflict. I believe, you know better than me, there are still many situations like Timor-Leste that are in, and still, still 
and resolve. Let this statistic sink in. There are more than 400 unresolved outstanding maritime boundary disputes in the world today. We know also a small archipelago, a very beautiful archipelago, San Tomé Principe, that also has this problem. A large number of these are in some of the world's most sensitive geopolitical areas, including in our region of Asia. These disputes are a real threat to global peace and security, and um, they were with us in the end, he said, peace and tranquility. That is why we are in the right place to talk about this. We are all here because we have faith in the potential to create more success stories. Anglos provides a framework for the peaceful resolution of maritime boundary disputes, but developing countries do not always enjoy effective and actual access to those mechanisms. While all nations may be equal before the law, not all nations have equal access to the international legal system. And it was raised also here. Capacity building. It was raised also this morning. Capacity building to the countries in need to understand. Underdeveloped or developing countries, small or fragile nations often lack the institutional capacity and expertise to effectively use the international legal system. From our experience with Australia, we learned that the challenges developing countries can face when coming up against a richer and more powerful neighbor, even when they pretend to be a friend. This is, this is the reality around the world. So I hope this panel and this conference will see our success story not as a reason to celebrate, but more as a reason to take action. Through the example of what we accomplished with Australia, we have provided proof that the rules-based architecture can still help achieve fairness, equity, and more essentially, Sovereignty. Our story is one of hope. And so we would be pleased to help any other country considering embarking on this process. Allow us to share our own experience and the lessons we have learned. Vanuatu Colas came to us, to our country. They were prepared to come, but they have other commitments and they send the ambassadors here. Like Vanuatu, other small countries also are facing the same challenges and problems. So, and let us use this conference to promote a dialogue of new ideas and new commitments to again prove something to the world to prove that we can do better and that we can act with confidence. Let Timor-Leste be an example of an effective rule of law and the international justice system. If many years ago I told you that Timor-Leste would one day attend a conference like this one as a story of triumph rather than tears a story of supremacy of justice over unlawful maneuvers and deceitful behaviors. Many 
or all of you would say I was dreaming. My friend Nelson Mandela that visited me in the prison used to say, people always call things impossible before they are done. From 79 to 99, during 24 years of difficult resistance against an illegal occupation by a big neighbor, helped by many Western countries, it was shown that not many could believe we will even survive. And we proved they were wrong. By applying the same spirit of resistance, commitment, and determination, and by using the tools we have at our disposal in the international system, we achieved the impossible. Finally, I want to acknowledge that we are here with many of our direct and indirect supporters. Don't look at me like this. Harold, <laughs> proud and grateful that you stood beside us with the same commitment to make justice prevail. It, it was only the objective that united us in our difficult struggle. This kind of support outside of institutions, and we saw the civil society coming here and talking, this kind of support outside of institutions is important, very important nowadays, because of its ability to influence the mindset of the decision makers. Before also, we could survive because of the international network of solidarity. Year by year, they moved the mindset of many governments. That is why coming here, talking to you, to you a little bit, just to say that Hitler's, Anglers, must be reinforced. Because there are many countries and many people waiting for your help, waiting for your assistance. In many ways, by trying to help them developing their human resources in capacity building, and by also, like you said yesterday, institutionalize the responsibilities. Because sometimes when a country is independent or when a country becomes democ democratic, Sometimes people think that everything is already on place. No, we have to help. We still, 20 years later, Harold mentioned, unfortunately, I am eminent person of the small G7 plus of 20 countries, fragile, in conflict, and post-conflict, mostly in Africa. Richer than us, but in conflict. This is the difficulty. Thank you very much, and thanks to Anglos for having me here. Thank you very much.
Minister Guzmao, uh, let me thank you, and I think I'm speaking on behalf of all of us, for your enlightening words that made very clear what the dispute settlement system of the, uh, of the uh, Law of the Sea Convention can achieve, um, at the same time not ignoring that there's still a lot of work to do. Um, so we do have a vision, and maybe the 25th anniversary of the entry into force of the Convention is the right moment to reflect upon that. Thank you very much. Um, you spoke about the uh, um, compulsory conciliation, and that leads us to dispute settlement and part 15 of the Law of the Sea Convention. And it's not easy, I have to say, for me to, to get so technical now, but I think I have to, with, uh, uh, well, certainly not only technical experts sitting next to me, um, quite the opposite, but that is what we would like to focus on in this panel. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce the four speakers to you. And I'll do this in alphabetical order. The first speaker is Judge Thomas Haidar, who has been a judge of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea since October 2014. Um, he is the president of the ITLOS Chamber for Fisheries Disputes, and as many will know, he served as legal advisor of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Iceland for a very long period of time, if I'm not mistaken, almost 20 years, and was awarded the title of ambassador in 2014. Thomas is also the director of the Law of the Sea Institute of Iceland and co-directing the famous Rhodes Academy of Oceans Law and Policy that takes place every year. The second speaker is Judge Abdul Koroma, um, who was judge at the International Court of Justice, the, if I may use that word, brother of the tribunal between 1994 and 2012, a former ambassador, permanent representative of Sierra Leone to the United Nations, uh, and a former chairman of the UN General Assembly's Sixth Committee. Judge Koroma was also chairman of the ILC, the International Law Commission, so no doubt a person with an extensive background and experience within the realm of public international law. And as we heard before, also involved in the uh, compulsory uh, conciliation. The third speaker is uh, Professor Gianna Mossop, uh, who is with the law faculty at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Now, this sounds like she has had probably the maybe amongst the longest ways to travel to Hamburg. That is not completely correct, because Joanna is right now uh, spending a sabbatical at the University of Edinburgh, where she works on issues, as she did in the past, concerning the law of the sea and international environmental law. Joanna is well known, not only for her book on the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles, but for many other extremely valuable publications concerning the law of the sea. And uh, where do I have the information? <laughs> my, my apologies. Um, dear colleague and friend, uh, Yoshi Tanaka, Professor of International Law at the University of Copenhagen. I think everyone will know Yoshi's books on the international law of the sea. I was delighted to be uh, handed over the third edition of his famous textbook on that subject matter, which obviously has just been published with Cambridge University Press. That is certainly not his sole uh, single authored volume, but rather he has submitted further um, books intra alia on the peaceful settlement of international disputes and forthcoming the South China Sea arbitration. It's wonderful to have you here with us in Hamburg. It's an honor. And Enough said, I think. Thomas, would you want to make the start? I already thought I switched on the... Thank you, Alexander, for the introduction. Thank you to Indiana University, to the uh, Universität Hamburg, and to IFLOS for putting together this wonderful program and for hosting this conference at the tribunal and for inviting me to speak. Um, 
As we uh, commemorate the 25th anniversary of the entry into force of the Convention, uh, obviously the, the focus is on the substantive provisions of the Convention, the, the zonal approach, the way the Convention uh, sets out the rights and obligations of coastal states and other states in different maritime zones, and basically it describes all uses of the oceans, rules regarding all of, all of those different uses of the oceans, but there is also <clears throat> the, the other achievement of the Convention, which is to put together a compulsory dispute settlement mechanism, which is the exception in international law. Because as you know, in general international law, consent is required for, for cases being brought to a third party dispute settlement. And so you could argue that from a rule of law perspective, the law of the sea is more developed than general international law. Um, however, there are, as you know, limitations in the Convention in Article 297 to the compulsory mechanism, and there are also optional exceptions in Article 298. And I want to deal with one of those exceptions today, um, <clears throat> one that the Tribunal uh, had the opportunity to address and clarify in a recent order in the Ukraine-Russia case. Um, so this is the uh, military activity ex exception. So uh, states can um, optionally accept uh, disputes concerning military activities, including military activities by government vessels and aircraft engaged in non-commercial service from the compulsory dispute settlement mechanism. Now, until this year, there was only one case that had addressed this issue, and that was the South China Sea arbitration that has been mentioned in different contexts earlier today. Um, and there were two submissions by Philippines that were, where China um, uh, relied on the um, uh, military activities exception. One was regarding submission number 12, occupation and construction activities on mischief reef. The, um, uh, the arbitral tribunal stated that uh, it will not deem activities to be military in nature when China itself has consistently resisted such classifications and affirmed the opposite at the highest level. Accordingly, the tribunal accepts China's repeatedly affirmed position that civilian use comprom comprises the primary, if not the only, motivation underlying the dramatic alterations on mischief reef. As, civili as civilian activity, the tribunal notes that China's conduct falls outside the scope of Article 298.1b and concludes that it has jurisdiction to consider the Philippines' submission. The second submission, number 14, related to ag aggravation or extension of the dispute between the parties. And the result here was a bit different from the, from the other case. The tribunal notes that Article 298.1b applies to disputes concerning military activities and not to military activities as such. Accordingly, the tribunal considers the relevant question to be whether the dispute itself concerns military activities rather than whether a party has employed its military in some manner in relation to the dispute. And further, the tribunal finds that the essential facts at Second Thomas Shoal concern the deployment of a detachment of the Philippines' armed forces that is engaged in a standoff with a combination of ships from China's Navy and from China's Coast Guard and other government agencies. In connection with this standoff, Chinese government vessels have attempted to prevent the resupply and rotation of the Philippine troops on at least two occasions. Although, as far as the tribunal is aware, these vessels were not military vessels, China's military vessels have been reported to have been in the vicinity. In the tribunal's view, this represents a quintessential, quintessentially military situation involving the military forces of one side and a combination of military and paramilitary forces on the other, arrayed in opposition to one another. As these facts fall well within the exception, the tribunal does not consider it necessary to explore the outer bounds of, what, of what, what would or would not constitute military activities 
for the purposes of Article 298.1b. Accordingly, the Tribunal finds that it lacks jurisdiction to consider the Philippine submissions number 14, etc. Now, in, in May this year, uh, this tribunal um, uh, rendered an order in the, in the case concerning the detention of three Ukrainian naval vessels, Ukraine versus Russia, and this was the provisional measure case. The case on the merits is now before a, an arbitral tribunal. This case relates to an incident that took place on 25 November 2018 in the Black Sea near the Kurt Strait, actually a little bit south of the Kurt Strait, which you see on the picture here. Uh, three Ukrainian naval vessels with 24 servicemen from Ukraine on board had departed from the port of Odessa in the Black Sea, and their mission was to transit north through the Kurt Strait to the port of Berdyansk in the Sea of Azov in the north. When the Ukrainian vessels proceeded to the strait, they were blocked by Russian Coast Guard vessels. The Ukrainian vessels later turned around and navigated away from the strait southward, but were pursued by the Coast Guard vessels. During the pursuit, one Coast Guard vessel fired at one of the Ukrainian vessels, wounding three members of its crew and causing damage to the vessel. In the following course of events, the three Ukrainian vessels and the servicemen on board were arrested and detained by the Russian Coast Guard vessels. Criminal proceedings were instituted against the servicemen who remained in prison in Russia. On 16 April 2019, Ukraine submitted to the tribunal a request for the prescription of provisional measures under Article 290, Paragraph 5 of the Convention. Previously, Ukraine had instituted arbitral proceedings against Russia under Annex 7 of the Convention. Ukraine requested the tribunal to order the release of the three naval vessels and their servicemen and the suspension of the criminal proceedings against the servicemen. Russia decided not to participate in the hearing on the case, which took place on 10 May last, but they, they did submit a memorandum to the tribunal regarding its position on the circumstances of the case. Under Article 290, Paragraph 5 of the Convention, the tribunal may prescribe provisional measures if, among other requirements, it considers that prima facie, the arbitral tribunal which is to be constituted would have jurisdiction in the case. One of the key questions that the tribunal had to decide in this regard was whether Article 298 1B of the Convention was applicable, thus excluding the case from the jurisdiction of the Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal. Both parties had made declarations under Article 298 1B, both Ukraine and Russia, excluding from the compulsory dispute settlement mechanism disputes concerning military activities. Russia maintained that the dispute concerned military activities and was therefore excluded from the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal. Ukraine, however, asserted that the dispute did not concern military activities, but rather law enforcement activities, and was therefore not excluded from the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal. Now, as to the findings of the tribunal, in its view, the distinction between military and law enforcement activities cannot be based solely on whether naval vessels or law enforcement vessels are employed in the activities in question. This may be a relevant factor, but the traditional distinction between naval vessels and law enforcement vessels in terms of their roles has become considerably blurred. The tribunal further stated that nor can the distinction between the military and the law enforcement activities be based solely on the characterization of the activities in question by the parties to a dispute. This may be a relevant factor, but such characterization may be subjective and at variance with the actual conduct. You, you will realize that this is a, a, a little bit of a different approach from the South China Sea arbitration award. Now, what was uh, characteristic for this dispute is that 
Following the incident in, in, uh, in November uh, 2018, um, there were contradictory public statements made both by Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine maintained at that time that the activities by Russia were um, uh, basically um, uh, act of aggression, uh, so armed conflict, they, they stated, was the, was the nature of this activity, whereas uh, Russia toned it down and refused that allegation. And, and then, of course, when these parties uh, submitted their, made their submissions to the tribunal, uh, their uh, positions had changed because of the military activities exception. So that may shed some light on why the tribunal was hesitant about relying on characterizations of the parties that would change from one time to the other, depending on, on circumstances. And the tribunal stated thirdly that rather the distinction between military and law enforcement activities must be based primarily on an objective evaluation of the nature of the activities in question, taking into account the relevant circumstances in each case. Three such circumstances in this present case were examined by the tribunal in this regard. First, it appeared to the tribunal that the underlying dispute leading to the arrest concerned the passage of the Ukrainian naval vessels through the Kurd Strait. In this respect, the tribunal observed that it is difficult to state in general that the passage of naval ships, per se, amounts to a military activity. It emphasized that under the Convention, passage regimes, such as innocent or transit passage, apply to all ships. Second, the tribunal found that the facts indicate that at the core of the dispute, was the party's differing interpretation of the regime of passage through the Kurd Strait. In the view of the tribunal, such a dispute is not military in nature. And third, the tribunal considered the context in which Russia used force in the process of arresting the Ukrainian vessels. The tribunal stated that after being held for about eight hours, the Ukrainian naval vessels apparently gave up their mission to pass through the strait and turned around and sailed away from it. The Russian Coast Guard then ordered them to stop, and when the vessels ignored the order and continued their navigation, started chasing them. It was at this moment and in this context that the Russian Coast Guard used force, first firing warning shots and then targeted shots. One vessel was damaged, servicemen were injured, and the vessels were stopped and arrested. In the tribunal's view, Considering the above sequence of events, what occurred appears to be the use of force in the context of law enforcement operation rather than a military operation. For the tribunal, the aforementioned circumstances suggested that the arrested detention of the Ukrainian naval vessels by Russia took place in the context of a law enforcement operation. In addition to the aforementioned, the subsequent proceedings and charges against the servicemen further supported the law enforcement nature of the activities of Russia. The servicemen had been charged with unlawfully crossing the Russian state border and the Russian Federation had invoked Article 30 of the Convention entitled non-compliance by warships with the laws and regulations of the coastal state to justify the detention of the vessels. Accordingly, based on the information and evidence available to it, the tribunal considered that prima facie Article 298, Paragraph 1b of the Convention does not apply in the present case. The tribunal concluded that all the requirements for the prescription of provisional measures under Article 295 of the Convention were met. Prima facie jurisdiction, uh, plausibility of the rights asserted by Ukraine and urgency of the situation. The tribunal ordered by 19 votes to one the immediate release of the Ukrainian naval vessels and the 24 detained Ukrainian servicemen. It did not consider it necessary to require Russia to suspend criminal proceedings against the servicemen. However, the tribunal considered it appropriate to order both parties to refrain from taking any action which might aggravate or extend the dispute submitted to the Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal. The tribunal considered that prima facie Article 298 1b of the Convention did not apply in the present case 
based on the information and evidence available to it. It should be noted that Russia did not participate in the hearing in the, on the case and only submitted a memorandum to, to the tribunal regarding its position on the circumstances of the case. It is to be expected that the Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal will examine this matter more thoroughly in order to decide whether Article 298.1b is applicable and whether it has jurisdiction in this case. The Arbitral Tribunal may possibly be in a position to do so on the basis of more detailed information and evidence provided by the parties. Now, uh, we, I normally read, read blogs following uh, judgments and orders, and this is one of the headings of one of the blogs. Did Itlos just kill the military activities exemption in Article 298? I don't think so. Uh, it seems in, in this particular blog that the author is of the view that um, any navigation by foreign warships in maritime areas subject to a coastal state sovereignty or jurisdiction is a military activity. Uh, I don't think that is the case. And also that any dispute between a coastal state and a flag state concerning such navigation is a dispute concerning military activities in the meaning of Article 298.1b of the Convention. I also do not think that is the case. Um, more generally, and this is my last uh, slide, there seem to be like three different schools of thought, and this was actually picked up by Garth uh, Schofield this morning in a different context. Uh, in this context that I'm talking about here, uh, it is stated, uh, firstly, that the term disputes concerning military activities should be interpreted broadly, considering the highly political nature of military activities. And some would add that it is really up to the state that is uh, relying on the military, military activities exception to define what are military activities for the purposes of, of that state. Um, then secondly, there is this view that this term should be interpreted narrowly as Article 298 includes exceptions from the general principle of compulsory dis settlement of disputes concerning the interpretation or application of the Convention. But as Garth Schofield said this morning, there is also the, the normal interpretation. And it seems in, in the literature there is very much focus on either broad or narrow interpretation. Nobody, nobody states that normal interpretation is the way to go. And I think that is what the tribunal did in this case. That is at least my, my understanding. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas, for your detailed assessment of the military exemptions clause. Um, Judge Kroma, please. Good afternoon, Your Excellencies and dear friends. Thank you, Professor Proles, for your very generous introduction earlier. I would also like to thank um, the Hamilton Luger School, the Faculty of Law of the University of um, Hamburg, and the <coughs> Law of the Sea Trust for inviting me here this afternoon um, to participate in this um, conference in this um, observance of the 25th anniversary of UNCLO since it came into force. Um, Mr. Chairman, you may allow me to digress a bit, considering the interesting discourse which took place here this morning. Of course, it is inevitable that discussing the law of the sea, reference has to be made to Hugo Grotius, who is considered the father of international law, but as you are all aware, Hugo Grotius addressed the issue of freedom of the ISIS, freedom of navigation, Mare Liberum. But I thought a, I thought a more relevant um, reference would have been Harvard Pado of Malta. Um, as students of international law, the law of the sea would recall his 1967 four-hour speech at the United Nations General Assembly in Doris, four hours, if you could imagine. And it was Avid Prado who referred to the exploitation of the resources 
of the sea as the common heritage of mankind. Professor Ko alluded to that this morning. So, and it's not only how we say it, but Abid Pado is regarded as the modern father of international law. But it's not only in terms of being of paternity, I want to make the point, because the issue of exploitation on conservation has been discussed here this morning. And I think for the right frame of reference would be um, to have it Papado's speech um, in 1967, much of which um, was reflected in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Secondly, reference was made to the opaque provisions of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. How do you interpret, how do you bring clarity to such um, convention? Let me first of all make, and as you all are aware, there is no official travel preparatory as far as the Law of the Sea Convention is concerned. I was fortunate. I, was I part, to have participated in the construction, in the elaboration of the Law of the Sea Convention, and it was agreed that there should be no trap or perpetua. But notwithstanding, however opaque or unclear any of those provisions would be, we still have to rely on the spirit of the Convention. Of course, there is Article 31 of the Law of the Sea Treaty. The spirit of the Convention has to be taken into consideration, and the the practice of state also has to be borne in mind. But before proceeding further, I would like to recognize um, Professor Pike, the president of the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. And today is my first time of coming to Hamburg. I've never been to Hamburg. Of course, I'm familiar with Hamburg as part of the Anseatic League. And during my United Nations days, I worked on ONSI trial, and we adopted the Hamburg rules way back in the day. And it's a very beautiful and organic city. And I think three or four weeks ago, I was um, with Professor Park in uh, The Hague for the Institute of International. So I'm delighted to be in your territory, as it were, in your jurisdiction. Now, returning to the issue um, which is ripe for discussion, which I'm invited to discuss is the 25 years of UNCLOS and the compulsory conciliation commission between Timor-Leste and Australia under UNCLOS. First of all, I think Timor-Leste, as the first nation state of the 21st century, should be applauded for its trust and confidence in the rule of law and in the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Timor-Leste, as a new nation, was bold enough, courageous enough to submit itself, because it was not only Australia that was um, before the tribunal, but Timor-Leste was brave and courageous enough to submit its dispute to compulsory um, dispute settlement of the Law of the Sea Convention. Now, the, maritime, the settlement of maritime delimitation dispute between Timor-Leste and Australia is unique as the first such dispute to be resolved under UNCLOS. But it also demonstrates that disputes between states, however difficult they may appear at first sight, are capable of peaceful resolution in accordance with international law, in accordance with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Permit me to make a declaration here. Maybe I should have been an East, or should I say, uh, yeah, allow me for now, an East Timorese, um, someone from Timor-Leste. As was um, an announced or declared early on, I used to be the permanent representative of Sierra Leone to the United Nations in the 70s and 80s. At that time, Timor-Leste was on the list of decolonized territories. But as you know, those were the days of the Cold War. And uh, Timor-Leste was isolated. Of course, there were some states that did not recognize the occupation of Timor-Leste. But in my capacity as chairman of the Decolonization Committee of, or the Committee of 24, 
I thought that in the name of self-determination and in the name of justice, Timor or less, I was entitled to a hearing before the Committee of 24. And as you know, as chairman, it's on the one, one of those few occasions when the chairman would have some ability, some leeway to give hearing to a state, to a petitioner state, because that was what Timor Leste was doing. And in those difficult days, as you, some of you may recall, Timor Leste had one representative or one ambassador throughout the whole world. And the United Nations Committee of 24, the Colonization Committee, was its main forum in which it was able to address the international community at large about what was going on in Timor-Leste or in East Timor in those days. But that was not the end of the matter. Um, no sooner had I joined the International Court of Justice in 1994, as if Timor-Leste was following me, one of the first cases that came before the court was the application by Portugal against Australia for exploiting, in a, in a nutshell, the resources of, um, of Timor-Leste. So the Portugal br brought a claim against Australia for not respecting its rights as far as um, Portuguese Timor-Leste was concerned. Of course, the court, for reasons of jurisdiction, did not allow the case to proceed into the merits because of Indonesia's involvement. Indonesia was a third party, as you, and as you know, Indonesia was in occupation of Timor-Leste, and under the rules, the statute of the ICJ, you cannot implead a third state that has not given its consent. But notwithstanding, um, I think I can, I'm proud to say that one of the essential issues, in spite of the fact that the application was not adopted, that was written into that judgment, was that the right of self-determination, I think that was the first time that it had been so called, was one of the essential principles of international law. And you could imagine how much we, effort was made in ensuring that that was embedded or was invested in the um, judgment at that moment in time. So that created a platform, in my view, for East Timor, for Timor Leste to, to continue its effort to achieve um, its rightful status amongst the community of nations. And there is a third element, um, as I said, why I could have become an East Timorese. East Timorese. Um, when East Timor launched its um, compulsory conciliation proceedings, I received a telephone call from the council of Timor-Leste one morning and asking whether I would be prepared to participate. Well, you know, I was really intellectually exhausted at that time. I said I had had enough. I, you know, I asked the council to come back in two weeks. I'm hoping that maybe another council would have been found or um, invited. The council came back in about two weeks. I said, okay, if um, it's, the, it's for the sake of East Timor, I would allow myself to participate in this case. And I'm very thankful that I allowed myself to take part in the compulsory conciliation um, between Timor-Leste and uh, Australia. I am thankful because of the outcome of that um, process, because of the outcome of the compulsory conciliation process itself. Regarding the dispute, Timor-Leste and Australia, both are neighboring coastal states, separated by the Timor Sea at a distance of about 300 nautical miles. Since 2004, the two states had been unable to successfully negotiate permanent maritime boundaries where their maritime zone overlapped. There was also a dispute concerning the development arrangements with respect to the Sunrise and Troubadour gas fields regarding the allocation of upstream revenue, the scope of the broader economic benefits that would follow from their developments, 
and the extent to which such benefits would be reflected in potential revenue sharing arrangements. Timor Lesse took a decision to have recourse to the compulsory conciliation mechanism under Article 298 and Annex 5 of UNCLOS to negotiate a solution to a maritime delimitation with Australia. Now, as we are all aware in this room, international law recognizes conciliation as a dispute resolution mechanism, which may be voluntary or compulsory, but whose outcome is non-binding. Conciliation is intended to assist the disputing parties to reach a mutually acceptable negotiated outcome by providing non-binding recommendations to the disputing parties and facilitating their negotiations. The conciliation proceedings initiated by Timor Lesa against Australia is the first of its kind under the conciliation proceedings envisaged under Article 298 and on Annex 5 of UNCLOS. In that dispute, the parties agreed to submit their dispute to compulsory conciliation. The Commission, as required by its mandate, investigated the dispute, secondly, proposed a solution, and thirdly, prescribed a solution in its report. In principle, conciliation is a form of inquiry. I had it said this morning, and it was not of the mark, that it was a kind of mediation. It could be a combination of both inquiry and mediation. But what is most important is that conciliation is not limited to question of facts and law, but also takes into account diplomatic considerations. The conciliation mechanism is suitable for a maritime delimitation dispute, as such disputes are not a zero-sum game in which all the area in dispute to be delimited or claimed by one of the parties would ipso facto be attributed to one party. Now, as far as compulsory dispute settlement in Part 15 of UNCLOS is concerned, Part 15 provides a safety net for the peaceful resolution of all disputes. By ratifying UNCLOS, all states give their consent as expressly stated in Article 286 of the Convention to submit any dispute concerning the interpretation and application of the Convention to the dispute settlement mechanism set out in Part 15. Article 287 provides states parties with an opportunity to declare their preferred forum for dispute settlement. In the compulsory conciliation between Timor-Leste and Australia, the Commission considered the jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice, including the North Sea continental shelf cases, on clause itself, state practice of drawing boundary lines and agreements for joint development cooperation. UNCLOS provides for two forms of conciliation proceedings, voluntary and compulsory. The difference lies in the nature of how a state party can initiate and terminate the conciliation. In contrast to com voluntary conciliation, compulsory conciliation can be invoked unilaterally by one party against another. Under UNCLOS, compulsory cor conciliation correspond to some of those disputes 
carved out from the compulsory dispute settlement under Article 297 and Article 298, such as sovereign rights relating to fisheries and scientific research under Articles 297 and 298. Article 2981A1 establishes two procedures for invoking compulsory conciliation. The exclusion of pre-existing disputes and the absence of, negoti of negotiated agreement limiting the compulsory conciliation. Furthermore, such disputes must arise subsequent to the entry into force of enclos. Secondly, there must not exist a prior negotiated agreement according to Article 281. Third, any dispute that necessarily involves concurrent consideration of any unsettled disputes concerning sovereign or other rights over the continental shelf or insular land territory, such a dispute deemed even too, is, was deemed too sensitive even for compulsory conciliation. However, once compulsory conciliation has been evoked, it follows that the procedure stipulated in Annex 5, unless the parties otherwise agreed, it's compulsory because the parties are bound to participate in the process until the commission issues its report or one of the parties rejects the recommendation in the report by written notification. Although the procedure is compulsory, but the recommendations of the commission themselves are non-binding. Each party is entitled to nominate up to four um, conciliators. In the Timor-Leste Australia Conciliation Commission, the commission took a proactive approach to suit the dispute. The commission received the opening positions of the parties in comprehensive statements the Commission then engaged the parties in open-ended discussion and then issued papers outlining the elements of the dispute and invited the parties for their respective views. Annex 5 allows for the Commission to address elements necessary to the amicable settlement beyond purely legal considerations including the discussion of joint management of petroleum resources on the broader economic effects of developing seabed gas deposits. The Commission was aware that its task was not simply to limit, to delimit the maritime boundary, but to address the party's underlying interests. At Annex 5 procedures allow for confidence building measures and played a significant part in the success of the conciliation as the parties were willing to abandon previous positions without prejudice but could use this as a leverage in future negotiations. Accordingly, in performing its functions, the Commission heard the parties examined their claims and objections and made proposals to them with the aim of reaching um, an amicable solution. We are proud to say that the recommendations which were made by the Commission found their way into the 2018 Maritime Boundary Treaty between Timor-Leste and Australia. The treaty establishes permanent maritime boundaries in the dispute area between Timor-Leste and Australia in the Timor Sea. I think this is important because all along Timor-Leste had argued and submitted to the Commission that it would consider its independence incomplete until there was a permanent maritime boundary between itself and Australia. The boundaries include a line between opposite coasts 
of Australia and Timor-Leste, and two, um, con two connecting lateral lines in the coast, and in the east and the west, that um, intersected the lines of the 1972 agreement between Australia and Indonesia. The comprehensive package agreement reflected the position of Timor-Leste. The boundary is largely a median line with a segment running a bit to the north of the median line of the 1997 Exclusive Economic Zone Treaty. The boundary put all the petroleum um, contributing fields in the JPDA of the 2002 Timor um, Sea Treaty, including the currently active Bayan Undan fields under Timor Leste's jurisdiction. In conclusion, I think the outcome of the dispute um, under the compulsory dispute settlement mechanism was a fair one. And I think for that reason, the both parties, Timor Leste and Australia, must congratulate themselves for their goodwill, for their spirit of give and take, and without which the Commission would not have been able to reach the, its conclusions. And the two parties must also congratulate themselves because they were willing, they put the past behind them and projected into the future. And hopefully what we have achieved in the 2018 treaty holds significant political and economic benefits for the parties. For Timor-Leste, the conclusion of the 2018 treaty is a groundbreaking achievement a validation of its principles of equidistance of over natural prolongation. Lastly, the 2018 Maritime Boundary Treaty also demonstrates the efforts of the Commission and the parties to ensure that the rights of the third state, Indonesia, would not be prejudiced. But notwithstanding, I think um, it was a good day for both Timor-Leste and uh, Australia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Judge Kromer, for your concise analysis of the uh, procedure as well as the outcome of the uh, conciliation. Thanks very much. Joanna, please. Thank you. I also have a set of PowerPoints, but um, I think yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much to the organisers for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm going to be doing something a little different. This morning, Professor Coe said that this panel was about the past. And actually, my presentation is about the future. Um, so I think it's a nice uh, segue, perhaps, to um, the discussions tomorrow. And what I want to talk about is the negotiations for a new uh, treaty on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, hereafter BBNJ. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about a, su a subject that's relatively undercooked at the moment, which is the possible dispute settlement provisions that might appear in that treaty. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about the discussions that have happened so far on dispute settlement, and then I want to go in and talk about some options for expanding on the dispute settlement um, that has appeared to date in the draft text. So for those of you who aren't aware, um, the BB&J negotiations uh, formally started a few, um, few years ago, but of course the subject has been under discussion for uh, a very long time, more than a decade. Um, and so the fact that we are now at the end of the third intergovernmental conference is very exciting. Um, and the idea is that four uh, 
IGCs have been approved and the next and last one will be in March and with any luck we may see an end and a conclusion to the treaty but we'll see whether that happens. Um, but what was very exciting about the third IGC was it was the first opportunity to discuss a draft text which was ably put together by the president of the conference, Rena Lee, who is with us today. So I apologise for the dense text. Um, you don't have to read it all. Um, but this is the, um, the draft that was put in, up for consideration at IGC3. And you'll see that the dispute settlement clause contained two draft articles. Um, and it's largely modelled on Articles 27 and 30 of the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement, which, like this agreement, is an implementing agreement under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So it makes sense that we look to that implementing agreement as a source of law and precedent for how we use or model dispute settlement in the new agreement. Um, understandably, I think, uh, the selection of articles on which to start the discussion was relatively selective. Um, and I'm going to go through um, shortly and talk about some other aspects of the dispute settlement provisions in the UN Fish Stocks Agreement and compare them and, and talk about potentially what might be useful to include and what might not. What I think was very important at IGC3 was there was general agreement on the need for a dispute settlement provision, and there wasn't a lot of debate um, or dispute about what was in the, um, in the draft text. The two, um, I guess, surprising or de interesting developments that came out of the brief discussion on dispute settlement was that some states called on the default forum under this agreement not to be the arbitral tribunal as set out in Article 287, Paragraph 5, but for it lost to be the default uh, forum for decision making. And the key reasons for those were largely the cost of arbitral tribunals and the uh, ability to rely on, a, on a, um, a standing court as being more efficient and more effective, particularly for developing countries. Another development um, was the call for some states to include the option of an advisory opinion within the new text. Now, I hope to have some time briefly to touch on those last two aspects, um, but I'm going to turn now to a comparison between the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement and the uh, new internationally legally binding instrument, um, also known as ILBI. Um, I want to start by saying, of course, that although ILBI and BB&J will be an implementing agreement in the same way that the UN Fish Stocks Agreement is an implementing agreement, there are significant differences between them, which may lead us to conclude that we need to take a slightly different approach to dispute settlement under the new treaty. Um, and I find this um, table of comparisons between the Stradling Fish Stocks Agreement and the, um, the issues under ILBI to be a, just a useful illustration of the fact that the issues in the Fish Stocks Agreement are relatively narrow, focused on a single sector um, and a group of treaties that are all largely modelled from the same parts of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. In addition, there is no institutional framework that's established under the Fish Stocks Agreement. In comparison, the BB&J Treaty, when it comes into effect, will cover a range of sectoral organisations and engage institutions from a range of different um, treaty traditions and um, source, sources of law. So it's also worth thinking about the sorts of disputes that might arise under the instrument, which I think should inform how a dispute settlement provision might be developed under this treaty. And it seems to me that there are two clear types of disputes that might potentially end up before a dispute settlement body. And of course, because we're still in the process of negotiating the treaty, we don't know entirely what the content will be. But as a general sort of observation, I think you can say that we were likely to see disagree or agreements or disputes about the interpretation of the agreement itself, 
um, both in terms of the rights and obligations that are established under it, the application of general principles of law, uh, the scope of the agreement, and also procedural rights within the agreement. But I think equally likely, and possibly even more likely, is the fact that we are likely to see disputes arising about the intersection between the, the ILB, or the BB&J Treaty, and other treaties, um, particularly in the context where the parties to the negotiations are keeping in mind the fact that the ILB must not undermine existing uh, global, regional, and sectoral bodies. Um, and of course, there, there might be provisions within the, in relation to marine genetic resources that could intersect or in, uh, have an overlap with intellectual property regimes. Um, there could very well be conflicts between the provisions of ILB, for example, in the relation to um, environmental impact assessment processes or the establishment of area-based management tools, um, and there may be some question about how those treaties might operate together. Um, and also, um, potentially, questions about the intersection between the powers of a conference of parties under ILB and um, those of global, regional, and sectoral bodies. So with that in mind, I'm now going to turn to the UN Fish Stocks Agreement and look at some of the provisions that weren't included in the draft text and just have a um, discussion about why they may or may not have been included and whether they should be included. Now, an important provision that isn't included or hasn't appeared in the draft text relates to the uh, application of the dispute settlement process not only to the, tr the treaty itself, the ILB, but to other agreements. Now, under the Fish Stocks Agreement, paragraph 2 of Article 30 allows for the dispute settlement process to be applied to the interpretation of the regional uh, fisheries management organisation treaties that are obviously part of um, the, the, the broader structure of international law relating to fisheries. Um, and so essentially the compulsory dispute settlement processes could apply, if we follow this approach, to um, interpretation of those regional fisheries management organisation treaties. And that makes sense because a lot of the content of the UN Fish Stocks Agreement was about fleshing out the obligations of RFMOs and parties to those agreements. So which leads, I guess, to a question, um, would it be appropriate to have a similar provision in ILBI, which would essentially mean that the Part 15 processes would apply to in disputes about the interpretation of treaties that intersect with ILBI, or so disputes that arise both under ILBI or those other agreements. I think the answer is probably not. Um, while on the one hand it might be seen as a wonderful example or, or opportunity to expand compulsory dispute settlement um, to a whole area of international law that aren't covered by it at the moment, I think that the parties to the negotiations are unlikely to be willing to accept that much of an extension uh, into other treaties. However, another issue that is connected to this is the issue of um, parallel dispute settlement processes. And most of you will be aware of the Southern Bluefin Tuna decision on jurisdiction. And in that d uh, decision, the tribunal found that where a dispute arises both under UNCLOS and another treaty, and the other treaty has a dispute settlement clause that does not include compulsory dispute settlement, so voluntary uh, submission to a dispute settlement body, then this amounts to an agreement to exclude compulsory dispute settlement under Article 281 of UNCLOS. Now, this was criticised by many commentators at the time for closing off the opportunity to use compulsory dispute settlement where a, 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 there is a parallel treaty that may have a, a voluntary dispute settlement clause. However, at the end of the um, decision, the tribunal said there might be possibility that the fish stocks agreement would resolve this issue. And some commentators have said, well, co well first of all, the problem is that when you bring uh, part 15 mutatis mutandis into the fish stocks agreement, you're also bringing article 281. So if you take the same approach to interpretation, that would exclude uh, compulsory dispute settlement there as well. 
However, some commentators have suggested that Article 32 that I just showed you would allow compulsory dispute settlement even for RFMOs with standard dispute settlement clauses on the basis that it essentially imports uh, the compulsory dispute settlement process into the treaty of the RFMO, and so you then have sort of competing dispute settlement processes, and the argument is that the lex specialis uh, would be the um, fish stocks agreement approach. So that solves, potentially solves that problem, but I, as I suggested, I don't think that we're likely to see a similar provision appearing in ILBI which means we are left with the parallel dispute settlement problem um, if this applies um, to the ILB as well. However, we have now got even more murky because in the decision on jurisdiction in the South China Sea case, the tribunal uh, cast doubt on the decision in the Southern Bluefin Tuna um, and said that they preferred an approach where the other treaty has to clearly opt out of the um, compulsory dispute settlement process, preferring instead uh, Judge Justice Kenneth Keith's uh, dissenting opinion in that, uh, in that tribunal decision. So what that leaves us with is a rather murky situation, uh, which isn't helpful when we're trying to work out how dispute settlement might work under um, the ILBI. So, it's, it's a problem, and I'm leaving it out there. Um, I suspect that um, it's, it's unlikely to be resolved in the time frame that we have. To, I don't think we're going to have time to really get into a lot of discussion in the IGCs about um, this potential problem. In relation to the UN Fish Stocks Agreement, there are a few other um, interesting aspects to the dispute settlement process that we could potentially consider. Um, the first one is that in paragraph 5 of Article 30, uh, in addition to the law from the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the Fish Stocks Agreement, RFMO treaties and other international law, um, the, any dispute settlement body is also suggested it should apply generally accepted standards for the conservation and management of living marine resources, which goes beyond the, the usual sources of law that you would expect. And I, I imagine it was an opportunity to allow a tribunal to bring in new developments within the field of fisheries management. And the question is whether we could look at something similar, given the idea that the ILB needs to be a, a living document. Article 29 of the Fish Stocks Agreement allows for an ad hoc expert tribunal sorry, panel, to be resolved to, um, to resolve um, technical disputes. And I think that that could be something that could be useful to consider here as well. And finally, Article 31 goes further than Article 290 of the Convention in calling on parties to come up with provisional arrangements um, if in, while they are waiting for dispute settlement to um, be concluded. And it says that non-parties to UNCLOS can declare that they do not consider themselves bound by um, provisional measures, although it doesn't exclude them from the application of the dispute settlement process more generally. So lots of things that I think haven't really been addressed so far that deserve some consideration. So in the last few minutes I have available to me, I just want to briefly touch on the two proposals that came out of the third intergovernmental conference uh, when we were talking about dispute settlement. And the first is whether the default option should be changed to ITLOS. And I'm aware that I'm standing in ITLOS and there may be some uh, in the room who are very uh, fond of this approach. And there are certainly some good arguments to say that ITLOS should be the default tribunal under the law of the sea, uh, under the ILBI. Um, of course, and, the, and as I said earlier, the key issue is that of equity. And a standing court, court is far less expensive for litigants than going to an arbitral tribunal where the parties bear the cost of the proceeding. In addition, there is the potential for an improved coherence of jurisprudence, um, and even though President Pike said this morning that there is already coherence of um, jurisprudence, um, having it lost more engaged in the cases may only assist in that aspect. 
There are, however, some arguments against changing the default option. And the primary argument against it is that um, it may lead to inconsistency in situations where cases come up which engage issues under both UNCLOS, perhaps the Fish Stocks Agreement, and the ILBI. And so in those situations, you may have a question as to which is the appropriate default tribunal. I'd also point out that there is an option under Article 287 for states to make a choice of it loss as the default forum. And still a small number of states have actually done this. Um, 37 states approximately have done this. Um, and I think there seems to be an increased interest in doing this among developing countries. But perhaps that's another way um, that states could, could look into this issue. The second issue is um, having an option for advisory opinions. And it seems hard to argue against this. Um, as was mentioned this morning, under case 21, the tribunal found that it had the option to um, give an advisory, an opi advisory opinion. This was controversial. Uh, around 10 states put in submissions saying that they didn't think that this was the appropriate case, but we essentially have a fait accompli now. Um, and the tribunal has said that it does um, have jurisdiction to give an advisory opinion. Um, and in my view, I think there's nothing to lose in uh, including advisory opinions, um, and particularly they offer an opportunity to provide legal guidance where there isn't the right circumstance for a con contentious case to arise. Because I'm in my last 20 seconds or so, um, I'll just move on to my conclusions, which are that um, Clearly, a, a dispute settlement provision is desirable, and I think I might be talking to the converted in this room. Um, but I also think we need to remember that dispute settlement is only part of a broader question of how to ensure compliance with international agreements. And the issue of how to achieve that compliance has been discussed during the negotiations and needs to, to be kept in mind. I would suggest that at the moment, the dispute settlement provisions that we have in the draft text are undercooked, but there hasn't really been enough time for states to really discuss them. Um, and I would suggest that um, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement does serve as a model that could be used in more detail than has already, but of course there are limitations in the extent to which it can just be repeated wholesale into the new treaty. And I, finally, I would finish by saying that there is scope for creative thinking. Um, not a lot of time left, but I think that it would be worth thinking further about how dispute settlement could be included in the new treaty. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joanna, for giving us such a wonderful outlook to potential future developments in the context of the BBNJ. It'll be um, certainly points to discuss, and that's looking forward to that. Thanks very much. And last but not least, Yoshi, please. Thank you, my friend, uh, Professor Poleris, for your kind introduction. And I thank the conference organizers for giving me this opportunity to give a presentation at the conference on 25 years of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea at Itoros. Today, I'd like to briefly address the issue of an environmental impact assessment in the jurisprudence concerning marine environmental protection in the broad context of changing paradigms in the law of the sea. In my view, the law of the sea should be considered as a dual legal system comprising two paradigms. The first paradigm aims to reconcile individual interests of states in each jurisdictional zone. In this sense, the state is regarded as the primary subject of the law of the sea. Under the first paradigm, the law of the sea divides the ocean into multiple jurisdictional zones. In this sense, this paradigm can be called the law of divided oceans. 
the spatial ambit of each jurisdictional zone is in principle defined spatially based on distance from the coast irrespective of the nature of the ocean and natural resources within it. In this sense, the first paradigm or the law of the divided oceans is spatial by nature. The law of divided oceans is essentially governed by the principle of sovereignty and the principle of freedom, and the compliance with rules of the law relies on the principle of reciprocity. In summary, following the time-honored formula of late Professor Friedman, we can say that the first paradigm essentially reflects the international law of coexistence. In contrast, paradigm two that is, the law of our common ocean aims to safeguard common interests of the international community or community interest at sea by providing a legal framework for ensuring international cooperation in marine affairs. International cooperation necessitates international institutions. Accordingly, the law of non-state actors such as international institutions is of particular importance in the second paradigm. Contrary to the first paradigm, the second paradigm focuses on the unity of the ocean. This will require more holistic or integrated management approach. Furthermore, since the principle of reciprocity essentially governs bilateral and contractual relations between atomistic states, the traditional compliance mechanism on the basis of the principle of reciprocity contains an inherent limit in the protection of community interest. Therefore, the law of our common ocean adopts a more institutional approach to secure compliance with relevant rules. Overall, the second paradigm, or the law of our common ocean, can be thought to reflect the international law of cooperation. The two paradigms are not mutually exclusive, but coexist in the law of the sea. However, the balance between the two paradigms may change over time. As Judge Jima pointedly observed, with the emergence of the concept of common interest of the international community as a whole, or community interest, international law is entering into a new stage. Reflecting this trend, it appears that the second paradigm focusing on the protection of community interest is gaining its importance in the law of the sea. I think that the rule of international courts and tribunals should be considered in the context of changing paradigms in the law of the sea. Given that a healthy marine environment provides a foundation for all life, the protection of the marine environment can be considered as a common interest of the international community as a whole. In fact, the Itoro Seabed Dispute Chamber, in its advisory opinion of 2011, accepted the Elga Omnes character of the obligations relating to preservation of the marine environment of the high seas and in the area. In this connection, interestingly, late Judge Rao and the former legislator, Mr. Philip Gauthier, supported the standing of any state party to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in response to a violation of an environmental obligations under the convention committed outside marine areas under its jurisdiction. This view seems to be supported by the 2005 resolution of the Institute de Droit International accepting the standing in response to the alleged breach of obligation Elga Omnes. It seems that international litigation to invoke responsibility of a state for the breach of obligations Elga Omnes or Elga Omnes parties would open the way to protecting community interests through international adjudication. In addition to the traditional rule of international dispute settlement, the rule of an international court or tribunal seems to be increasingly important in the protection of community interests, such as marine environmental protection. Under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. According to the Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal in the South China Sea Arbitration, this provision contains two key components. The first is the due diligence obligation. In the words of the Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal, 
Article 192 includes a due diligence obligation to prevent the harvesting of species that are recognized internationally as being at risk of extinction and requiring international protection. The second is the intertemporal element. According to the arbitral tribunal, the general obligation under Article 192 extends both to protection of the marine environment from future damage and preservation in the sense of maintaining or improving its present condition. The marine environment, including marine ecosystems, is dynamic by nature, and ecological conditions in the oceans may change over time. Environmental knowledge and technology are also developing rapidly. Accordingly, it's necessary to take account of time elements in the interpretation of environmental norms in order to adapt them to new situations. I think it's important that the arbitral tribunal in the South China Sea Arbitral Award incorporated an intertemporal element into Article 192. However, the arbitral tribunal provided no further precision regarding a specific mechanism to prevent future damage. Here, an environmental impact assessment may come into play. As the Itro Civil Dispute Chamber and ICJ stated, today the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment can be regarded as part of customary international law. In the Law of the Sea Convention, the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment is provided in Article 206. In this regard, two observations can be made. The first is the intertemporal nature of an environmental impact assessment. Environmental impact assessment seeks to detect signs of future environmental risks and impacts of a proposed project before authorizing or funding the project. The signals they themselves do not belong to the future, but present. But from them, the future can be, to some extent, predicted. In this sense, environmental impact assessment can be considered as a legal device to address intertemporality in the protection of the marine environment. The second observation is that, as the ICJ stated, the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment is closely linked to the obligation of due diligence. There appears to be good reasons to argue that a state whose activities cause serious environmental damage would not be able to deny breach of the obligation of due diligence under Article 192 of the Convention on the grounds of non foreseeability if it had not conducted an environmental impact assessment. In this sense, Arguably, the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment provides a procedural means to effectuate the general obligation to protect the marine environment under Article 192. However, the question that arises in this context relates to the specific contents of the assessment. On this issue, the ICJ in the Palp Mill case took the view that it is for each state to determine in its domestic legislation or in the authorization process for the project the specific content of the environmental impact assessment required in each case. In so stating, the court didn't ex specify any independent content of the environmental impact assessment obligation. Likewise, the court in Costa Rica and Nicaragua simply stated that determination of the content of the environmental impact assessment should be made in light of the specific circumstances of each case. Since the contents of an environmental impact assessment remains less clear, it would be difficult for an international court or a tribunal to determine whether a state fulfilled the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment. In reality, the Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal in the South China Sea Arbitration encountered this problem. In this case, the question arose whether China had fulfilled obligations to conduct an environmental impact assessment under the Law of the Sea Convention. On this issue, the Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal admitted that it could not make a 
definitive finding that China had prepared an environmental impact assessment, but neither could it definitively find that China had failed to do so. According to the tribunal, however, such a finding is not necessary in order to establish a breach of Article 206, since what is more important is the obligation to communicate. Article 206 of the Law of the Sea Convention obliges states to communicate reports of the result of assessment on the potential effects of planned activities on the marine environment. According to the tribunal, the obligation to communicate reports of the result of the assessment is absolute. The tribunal eventually decided that the China had breached its obligation under Article 206 because of the absence of communication. Given that it may be difficult to determine whether a state properly carried out an environmental impact assessment, the tribunal's approach focusing on the non-fulfillment of a procedural requirement of communication is noteworthy. Finally, I briefly mentioned the rule of provisional measures prescribed by ITROS to secure the implementation of an environmental impact assessment. An illustrative example is provided by the 2003 land reclamation case between Malaysia and Singapore. In this case, it was ordered the establishment of independent experts group to assess the risks and effects of the proposed works. The effect of provisional measures seems to be equivalent to effectuate a joint environmental impact assessment. Furthermore, since environmental conditions may change with time, there is a need to continue monitoring the ongoing environmental risks and impacts after a project has begun. Accordingly, environmental impact assessment needs to be complemented by a monitoring system. In this regard, it is noteworthy that in the land reclamation case, it was ordered the disputing parties to exchange information on a regular basis. As a consequence, environmental risks or effects of Singapore's land reclamation works were to be jointly monitored by the disputing parties. A similar duty of exchange of information and monitoring was also ordered by ITROS in the Mox plant case. The land reclamation order, along with the Mox plant order, has proven that provisional measures can be used as a judicial procedure to oblige the disputing parties to carry out a joint environmental impact assessment and monitoring of the marine environment. It seems to me that the securing an environmental impact assessment and monitoring through provisional measures should be an alternative well worth considering. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much for the detailed analysis of the uh, relationship between Article 192, the duty to undertake an environmental impact assessment, and the consequences deriving therefrom. We're a little bit behind uh, time, but um, instead of uh, not having any discussion, I'm going to be very brutal and cut down the coffee break. <laughs> um, so, but what we're going to do is collect questions um, in order to uh, then give the speakers um, the possibility to answer them maybe in two rounds um, or so. I see Monica having uh, the first question. Yes, please. Yes, I'd like to um, go back to something that was raised in the um, panel before um, and then seek your views um, on, on this point. Um, so we heard before that um, there was a mentioning of security, of security Council resolutions um, and it was argued that somehow this was um, contradictory to some of the obligations, for example, that may be seen uh, in UNCLOS. That was on a specific case of migration and uh, a problem that was very well explained um, concerning human rights and the law of the sea. Um, but my, my approach would be that um, Security Council resolutions are not uh, non-law. I mean, it is part of international law. Uh, and where I am going is that perhaps it would be interesting to hear what, what is your take on generally the interpretation of UNCLO so far in, in, in all these years, um, and then other regimes, that is the interaction of UNCLOS uh, obligations, etc., and how it's been interpreted 
um, and how other sources of international law, such as um, treaty obligations, you know, in other contexts, maybe the Paris Agreement in the future, could be uh, considered when, when um, analyzing and uh, um, be able to um, draw the law more clearly when it comes to uh, scenarios that um, ITLOs or generally arbitral tribunals applying the law of the sea may have to um, deal with in the future. Thank you very much. More questions? Then let me, oh yes, I see some questions behind there. The two gentlemen sitting next to each other. I'm now from Bahrain and uh, yeah. I'm an Ipan fellow, so my question will be regarding to uh, military activity, specifically the, the distinguish between uh, military activity and uh, law enforcement activity. So uh, as you know, uh, m uh, like many or most of the Navy around the world considers as a military force where the Coast Guard is, you can find it uh, civilian in uh, some countries and military and force in other country and we have many joint missions between uh, navy and coast guard uh, not only in the domestic uh, level also in the international level such as ctf combined uh, task force so my question is uh, in the ukraine and uh, russia case uh, if our, our russian naval vessel engaged in the detention mission is that will be different uh, situation that will be different in this case or thank you could you just pass on yes to your neighbor please uh, thank you professor my uh, I'm Wen Lan. I'm a legal intern here at this tribunal my question goes to judge Karoma uh, in terms of the Timor Leste Australia conciliation case in which I have a lot of interesting uh, the final report and recommendations of the Conciliation Commission seems to come uh, of May 2018 seem to come out a bit later than what was expected. And I'm not sure if you are positioned to tell us what happened in that time, but uh, uh, I would be very interested to know uh, for this minor procedure delay. And uh, in the report, uh, the commission said, uh, unlike the decision on competence, which is binding on parties, this report and recommendation is not binding. Uh, I'm wondering, um, since the Conciliation Commission has interpreted and uh, some provision on UNCLOS, and the commission thinks that's a binding decision, uh, what kind of uh, legal status or uh, would you accord, uh, would you think, uh, of, do you think of this decision on competence would be, do you think, do you expect future R R R Annex 7 arbitral tribunals and ITOS to uh, reference to the decision on, competen uh, on, uh, on competence uh, when they come to interpret the same provision of one clause? Thanks. Thank you very much. And to make it even Oh, there's another one. Yes, then I, I'd rather be silent myself, please. You were first. Oh, it's even two, is it? Yes. Good afternoon, uh, Judge Hader and uh, Panel C. My name is John Leach. I'm the Vanuatu Ambassador to European Union, uh, based in Brussels. I would like to uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting Vanuatu to this event and uh, joining uh, President uh, Gosmao. I would like to also offer our apologies for our chief negotiator, MB Choni Konaba, who is not able to join us at uh, this very important meeting. Uh, Judge Heda, Vanuatu is a small island state, as you know, and as discussions has been going on this uh, morning, um, that is facing uh, effects of global warming, effects of uh, sea level rise that has continued to affect uh, Vanuatu and also other low-lying island states in the Pacific. I'm sure for most of you uh, who are following the media very closely will be aware of the position that Vanuatu is taking uh, under the uh, PIF uh, resolution that just came out from Tuvalu in Vunafuti. So other islands that are affected are Kiribati, Tuvalu and few uh, other countries, especially also including the Caribbean. If uh, some of you are following very closely, the devastating cyclone going uh, went at uh, 200 miles per hour, uh, cyclone Dorian, devastatedly affected the uh, Caribbean uh, island of Bahamas. I will uh, 
tried to take my uh, intervention to your panel and I was struggling to find how I could take this uh, to be concise. But first, uh, first point is, uh, yes, we have a uh, maritime boundary dispute that is currently going on with France. Our former, uh, one of our former colonial powers, uh, for Vanuatu, as we got independence in 1980, France um, still claim um, territory of the Matthew and Handa. And this is a case that we are taking uh, following the proper channels. And we've had two rounds of uh, negotiations with, with uh, delegation from France. At this juncture, I would like to ask Panel C if there are any uh, possible technical capacity building support that could be uh, accessed by uh, ITLOS and by this uh, convention to island states such as Vanuatu, in our case where our Attorney General's office is under scarce resource, not only because we don't have enough manpower, but we are grappling with other legislations. We're going through transformation from a least developing country to a developing country. And as you know, uh, other issues, including uh, with EU, so we are trying our best to um, uh, ensure that we have those legislations and those reforms. So our AG's office is uh, under-resourced at the moment. Secondly, uh, Judge, the issue about um, global warming, as I would like to go back to, is that, as you have heard, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Ralph Regan Vanu, announced at the Climate Vulnerable Forum Virtual Summit last year in 2018 that Vanuatu is currently exploring legal options, including under international law, to address loss and damage from climate change. In this context, I would welcome the views of the panelists and indeed those present in the room on the added value of a potential advisory opinion from ITLOS on a legal question about the harm to the marine environment caused by climate change. I know this uh, question um, it's a hard one. It may uh, come to you as a surprise, but Judge, uh, we are here and we travel far, and this meeting only convenes once in a while, as you've heard this morning, so we would really appreciate some clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we now, I, I see that there is two more hands, but um, let's rather now give the panelists the, the uh, possibility to answer, uh, and I won't forget, okay? But I urge you to uh, frame your questions briefly afterwards because of the time. Thanks. Um, Thomas, would you want to start, please? Um, <clears throat> let me try to uh, deal with uh, some of those questions. Um, uh, the one that was uh, related to my presentation uh, about the, so the question was whether it would have made any difference in the outcome of the case if, if there had been naval vessels instead of uh, Coast Guard vessels involved. Well, it, it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, uh, what, I, what I stated earlier is that the, the tribunal uh, emphasized that the distinction between military and law enforcement activities cannot be based solely on whether naval vessels or law enforcement vessels are employed in the activities. Uh, um, so that means that you cannot take it for granted that if there were naval vessels involved rather than um, uh, Coast Guard vessels, that, that would necessarily change the, the outcome. But it might, because you have to look at the, the, the circumstances of the case and uh, um, so I, I guess I cannot give any, any, any clear answer to that uh, other than, that, than with these general words. Um, um, now let me just, re the, the last questions uh, from a um, representative of Vanuatu. Um, so there was a question regarding uh, uh, capacity building and uh, I think it is uh, appropriate to, to, um, to inform that the, the tribunal has uh, several capacity building opportunities. Uh, there are uh, Nippon fellows who, who are uh, admitted here uh, for nine months at a time um, from developing countries. Uh, so that program is, uh, is a very uh, um, thorough, uh, very detailed. It's a, I think it is high-level capacity building, so that is open to, to all 
uh, states, but I, I think in particular developing countries are benefiting from that. Um, also, I would like to mention other possibilities. There, there is also the internship program here. There is also the, uh, the IFLOS Summer Academy. And there are other academies around the world. There is the Rhodes Academy of Oceans Law and Policy. I happen to be involved in that one. And, and there is also the Yosu Academy in Korea, so where, where, there is a, a lot of, uh, where there are a lot of scholarships offered to developing country participants. So there are various options for, in general, for capacity building in the field of law of the sea. Um, and of course, there may be some specific opportunities as well, but I'm just talking about the general capacity building programs that I know of. Um, then when it comes to the, the question about advisory opinion regarding global warming and its consequences um, on, on, on island states such as, as yours, uh, well, I, th I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the president has um, uh, made a, a, a statement in New York uh, in, on the margins of uh, one of the meetings there about the, the possibilities of advisory opinion in this context. Uh, but what, what I think is obvious is that if there were any uh, questions to be framed um, under an international agreement and, and submitted to this tribunal, they would, have to be, they would have to focus on the law of the sea. So they could not uh, deal with uh, the effects of global uh, warming in general, but they would have to be r limited to the law of the sea. So that would be my, uh, that's how I could answer your question, I think. Thank you. Thanks. Yoshi, would you also comment on? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, I cannot answer each and every question, so the, uh, I'd like to uh, consider in particular the uh, first question. If I understand you correctly, the, uh, broadly speaking, the uh, first question concerns the manner of the treaty interpretation of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. In this regard, the, I think uh, two points can be made. The first point concerns the consistency of, inst uh, of interpretations among various international courts and tribunals. And generally speaking, uh, I have an uh, impression that the uh, international courts and tribunal, including it, the ITOROS, uh, pay an adequate uh, attention uh, to the uh, judgment of other uh, uh, tribunals, uh, court or tribunals, including the ICJ. So the, uh, generally speaking, uh, it seems to me that the uh, consistency with uh, the interpretation of uh, uh, interpretation of a uh, treaty uh, seems to be uh, secured. Rather, the uh, problem is that uh, it seems to me that the, uh, today the, there is a trend that international courts and tribunals quote uh, the judgments each other so the, and they uh, confirm the uh, customary nature of relevant rule without, without examining state practice and opinion juris. So the, uh, this is uh, called uh, institutional circulation. So the, uh, this method uh, is, in a sense, to contribute to secure the uh, uh, consistency of interpretation. However, at the same time, uh, it seems to me that there is a risk that the, uh, the interpretation uh, may be uh, departed from the actual state practice. So the, there is an advantage and uh, disadvantage uh, to rely on the uh, judgment of uh, multiple international judicial body, each other. And the uh, second related point concerns the importance of systemic interpretation, systemic treaty interpretation. The, uh, the interpretation of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is not an isolated uh, process. Uh, in, the, in the particular context of uh, marine environmental protection or uh, environmental protection in, in general, uh, there is a wave of various treaties, various environmental treaties. So the, uh, there is a need to uh, have a systemic outlook of multiple treaty, uh, multiple environmental uh, treaties. So uh, in this regard, I think that the, uh, there is a need to uh, take a systemic treaty interpretation. And actually, uh, in the South China Sea arbitration, the Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal uh, applied the systemic treaty interpretation with regard to the uh, interpretation of Article 192 of the Law of the Sea Convention. Thank you.
Thank you. Judge Kroma, please. There was also a question addressed to you. Thank you. Thanks um, to the question. I think the question is pertinent, but only I'm not sure if you were questioning the procedure, the time lag for, of the issue of the judgment. For me, I think what is um, pertinent, if I may say so, is that the conclusion of the 2018 treaty holds significant political and economic benefits for the parties. In economic terms, the establishment of permanent boundaries will allow for the um, petroleum development of the parties as well as for the economic activities to take place both in the e exclusive economic zone and in the continental shelf. I uh, you know as lawyers we are interested in procedure, but I must remind you that what the commission did was to make recommendations to the parties. The recommendations as themselves are not binding as such. It is for the parties to use those recommendations, translate them into treaties, and they seem to have done so um, successfully. So, and as I said in my presentation for Timor, let's say the conclusion of the 2 treaty is groundbreaking. It's a groundbreaking achievement and a validation of its principle and position all along that the contemporary boundary delimitation is based on the equidistance principle. We, we did not ignore the jurisprudence. And as you know, one of the parties argued in favor of territorial extension based on earlier jurisprudence, but the contemporary jurisprudence of uh, um, 74 and 83 is that of equidistance median line. Um, f if I may move on to, I think some other interesting questions were raised on the um, difference between the Security Council and uh, international treaties. I have a lot of respect for the Security Council, as I can make it um, bold here, um, but, but the Security Council is subject to international law. The Security Council is not above international law. And powerful as it is, I cannot recall that the Security Council has ever declared that it is acting contrary to international law. Or wherever we have considered the, at the Council to uh, resolution not to have been in accordance with international law, um, the Council has never taken that. But so I take your point. I agree with you. Um, the Security Council is the primary custodian for international peace and security. And even in that respect, I don't think the Council would be so bold to say they're acting contrary. I know you can bring up arguments where I know what you mean um, in the case of Kuwait and blah, blah, blah. I know I, I am not excluding those, but I'm trying to say, in essence, Security Council has to comply with international law. Oh, I think that yeah. um, I just wanted to say this morning I did not have the opportunity for the altruistic um, procedures which two of the participants in the previous panel, you know, both the, um, with respect to the um, plastic um, uh, accumulation which you're trying to clear, and in retrospect to see. What did you seek out? Yeah, I, I welcome you, and I think you should continue in your effort. It's not going to pay dividend immediately, but I think you're on the right track because you mentioned that, in fact, I think is it 16 um, states in uh, Germany we are prepared to um, accept the what you call them, the people who are seeking safety on board the board. So it's to carry on to get public opinion behind you, and I think the government will respond accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Joanna, do you want also to comment on that? I was questions? going to make similar comments to Yoshifumi, so I'll just allow that to rest in the interest of time. Thanks very much. You saved people's life, because I think we all need a coffee before yet another highlight of this conference, which implies that I would like to apologize to the two persons that had raised their hands. Could I kindly ask you to approach the speakers directly in the coffee break, because we really need to, to stop at this stage. My suggestion is to have, I hope you're not going to, <laughs> um, to have a 15 minute coffee break, and I'll explain that to Secretary uh, Hagel that we start five minutes later. But let us not stop Thank you for uh, reminding me of that. Let us not stop here. 
uh, before uh, giving a, a good round of applause to the four speakers who delivered wonderful presentations.